So I'm still waiting for Zoom to connect I to you. I didn't want to be videoed. I didn't want to be videoed chewing my <laughs> cereal. <laughs> Oh, excuse me. Okay, I believe we're connected. I think we are. It's it's we are not very good. Okay, so these again, we're reading from Helen's Notes, An Intimate Dialogue with the Christ Mind. And today we start, Helen, um, she says, I raised a point that biblical language is hardly behavioristic terminology. Answer, Jesus says, no, but they needn't be out of accord with each other either. Consider the golden rule. You are asked to behave toward others as you would have them behave toward you. This means that the perception of both must be accurate, since the golden rule is the order for appropriate behavior. You can't behave appropriately unless you perceive accurately, because appropriate behavior depends on lack of level confusion. The presence of level confusion always results in variable reality testing and hence variable behavioral appropriateness. Now, um, does everybody know what he's talking about when we talk about level confusion? Okay. Is that like different perceptions? Well, it is. So what he's saying is there's basically two levels. And the level of our mind, our whole mind, as we are in reality, is that it's we are perfect whole um, and in a totality where everything, in a sense, um, is as God created it, without opposite. Okay, now, level confusion would be to try to use that thinking in the world here of space and time when we try to, what he's saying, behave appropriately, our perception must be both accurate, must both be accurate. We must be accurate about ourselves and we must be accurate about the person that we're you know, talking to or relating with. Now, in reality, we would, just, we would be perfect and there'd be no way for the other person to be other than whole and perfect, and we would be whole and perfect, and we would be relating within and as the wholeness and perfection. Here in reality, here in space-time, um, what we do is we look at each other as we see each other, and then we behave based on what we think the situation is that we're in, and that involves our perception of ourself and the perception of our brother or the person that we're relating to. Now, if we try to confuse levels, what happens is we try to relate from a place that either, we either think about heaven as if it's being perceived as we perceive space and time, or we think about space and time as if there is no space and time because we're eternal. And, and what he's saying is because he's introduced those ideas of our reality, as well as dealing with Helen and Bill in the world of space and time. And because Helen has had experiences of beyond space and time, she needs to figure out how she's relating to the person she's dealing with in order for her perception and therefore her behavior to be accurate within that situation. And Jesus is saying to her, when you're in space and time, you will behave and act as if you're in space and time. Now, that doesn't mean to forget your brother's perfection and wholeness and to forget he's a son of God, but it does mean to deal with problems here in space and time. We need to see those problems clearly. And then, you know, we could ask for guidance about it 
or we can just deal with it as we see fit to deal with it. But we're not trying to relate the person, the people, as if they're whole and perfect when we're actually in space and time. But we are remembering that that's the truth of who they are. If that makes any sense. I think so. What came to my mind is like, it's okay to be angry at someone when you're in space and time, but to really go beyond that anger and remember that there's still a divine being and that we're all one beyond. Right. Well, well, that's true. So, so what, what people have a tendency to do is okay. They realize that we're all perfect in space and time, and then they get angry. And then they say, well, because I'm perfect, I shouldn't be angry. And they squash down the anger, thinking that that's the best way to relate to somebody and themselves. But it's not, because we must deal with the situations as they're being perceived so that our perception can be healed. And unless we do that, we can't heal our perception. We're constantly stuffing our feelings, and that's no good for us. That's basically what the situation is. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for asking. The presence of level confusion always results in variable reality testing and hence variability in behavioral appropriateness. All forms of self-image debasement are fundamental perceptual distortions. Mm -hmm. They inevitably produce either self-contempt or projection and usually both. Because somewhere inside of us, we know we're not a body and we all hate the bodies because we know we're not that. But without the understanding of why we so, you know, vehemently resist being a body, it doesn't make any sense because then we're just like you were saying, you know, we're distorted in our understanding of ourselves and not accepting of ourselves exactly as we are which is a problem. If we can't accept ourselves as we are, then we can't accept our brother as he is here in space and time. Since you and your neighbor are equal members of the same family, as you perceive both, so will you behave toward both. The way to perceive for golden rule behavior is to look out from the perception of your own holiness and perceive the holiness in, of others. Bill and you need considerable clarification on the channel role. Look carefully at Mrs. Albert. She is working miracles every day because she knows who she is. I emphasize again that your tendency to forget, forget names, is not hostility, but a fear of involvement or recognition. Now, this is interesting because it gets into it gets into really practical reasons why Bill and Helen do particular things. And they're not the reasons that they think. So <laughs> he's trying to help them understand why they think the way they do. So he's got to get into some serious stuff with them. Um, so her tendency is to forget names because if she forgets the names, it's like she doesn't have any recognition of them. So she's not involved with them. And that's her, that's a way her, she unconsciously deals with people. You, you had misinterpreted human encounters as opportunities for magic rather than for miracles. And so you tried to protect the name. This is a very ancient and primitive way of trying to protect the person. Now, when he says, when he says, human encounters as opportunity for magic rather than for miracles. What he means is when we think people, we try to get things from people, even if it's just recognition, it's just friendship, not necessarily physical things, but we're trying to get something for our personality, some sort of gratification for who we are or communication with somebody. And so, that's what he's talking about as magic. So he's saying whenever you meet a person, you're meeting them because you know you want to get something from them. You want them to give you something 
or you want to give them something to make you feel better. That's not a miraculous encounter would therefore be to meet the same person, but without the agenda and not know what's meant to occur, but allow for a miracle to occur because miracles are always, you know, they're, they're always intercessions from the divine to show us that we're equal and to show us that we're both love. So instead of having to get love from someone, the miracle allows us to know that we are what love is already. So there's no need to get anything. And in the non-necessity to get anything from anybody, we can't necessarily abuse the relationship. We can't take advantage of the relationship because as equals, we're equally love and we're equally one. And in that recognition, that recognition goes a whole lot further in helping us understand ourselves and our brother than it does if we meet our brother and think that we're supposed to give them something or they're supposed to give us something. And that's the purpose of the meeting. Because that any type of need reinforces lack and that reinforces inequality. It makes it so somebody's got more than somebody that has less. And what he's saying is that's not the way it is because we're all and both equally love here. And the only thing we really have to give and extend and share is the love that we are. Everything else is man-made and therefore less than eternal has nothing to do with our reality. And it val it's a validation of us being bodies in space and time rather than a miraculous encounter where we see each other as whole and perfect and not necessarily in space time, but beyond space time in who we are and also in what we're learning. Very old Jewish practice of changing the name of a person who is very ill so that when the list is given to the angel of death, the person's name will not be found, will not be, will not be found. So Helen and Bill were both um, sort of traditionally Jewish. Jewish. And a lot of this stuff goes back to like old Jewish, old understandings, old Hebrew ways of looking at things. Um, and that's what he's referring to. So what he's saying is that you guys still have a bit of this stuff in you. Like you may not think about it, but it's how you were raised, how you were brought up. And there's elements deep inside of you that still do things based on these things, but we do them in a slightly different way. That's why he's saying hey, Helen forgets people's names. So she doesn't have to be involved with them. Thinking that if she doesn't know who they are, there's no involvement. And like when, when changing the name of a person was very ill, so when the list is given to the angel of death, the person's name will not be found on it, and the angel of death won't be able to find that person. Therefore, we think we've saved that person from death because the angel of death who comes to collect our souls is unable to find that soul, not knowing the name of that person. This is a good example of the curiously literal regression which can occur in very bright people when they become afraid. You and Bill both do it. Actually, it is a device closely related to the phobia in a sense that they both narrow fear to a simple aspect of a much larger problem in order to enable them to avoid that. So let me see if I can put this in the context. All fear comes from um, the idea that we're separate from God. Okay. Now that fear, if it's true, is uncontrollable. So what we do is we try to find something that we can be fearful of, give it a name and deal with it as if that's the problem. When in fact, it's not the real problem at all. The real problem is the ultimate idea of separation and fear of God. 
So instead of dealing with that because it's way too wide and huge of a problem, we decide, oh, the reason why I don't like that person or the reason why I'm afraid is because, um, you know, I'm afraid of a particular type of animal because, you know, I remember stories from when I was a kid, okay? So then you go about trying to deal with the fear of the animal as a way to control your fear. When in fact, you both reinforce the fear in general and not dealt with the issue underlying all the fear that you're experiencing. And that's what he means here when he says, it is a device closely related to the phobia, which is fear. You know, I have a phobia, I have a phobia of whatever we, you know, people have all types of phobias, afraid of fire, afraid of ice, afraid of, you know, cars, afraid of driving, all types of phobias. So in, if we narrow it down and make it into we're afraid of driving a car, we, if we don't drive a car, we don't think we're going to be fearful. Yet we have to keep ourselves from being fearful to make that true. Now, our body and our minds are held in this tension where we're trying to keep something together that can't be kept together because the real fear is so much more vast than that and we're not dealing with it at all. So the source of the fear remains and the reinforcement of the idea that there is something to be afraid of is what we do when we turn our fear into a particular phobia or into a particular um, uh, idea. A similar mechanism works when you get furious about a comparatively minor expression by someone to whom you are ambivalent. A good example of this is your response to Jonathan, and Jonathan's her husband. It's a good response to, to, to Jonathan, who does leave things around in very strange ways. Actually, he does this because he thinks, now this is really funny here. He does this because he thinks that by minor areas of disorganization, he can protect his stability. And that's sort of the idea of we live in a dualistic world. So if he goes, if he tries to organize everything or hyper organize everything and keep everything hyper organized, he's living at one end of the spectrum. So what he does is he leaves things around and is disorderly in minor ways to prove to himself that he's not like suffering from this heightened sense of need to be organized. So he, he can think that he's normal when in fact he's doing, he, he's leaving things around because he's afraid if he's too far to one end, then he's, then he's not stable at all. He's over the edge, so to speak. So it's really the way Jesus taught and Remember, he's talking to two psychologists, and he knows more about this stuff than, you know, they do, which is really interesting. Actually, he does this because he thinks that by minor areas of disorganization, he can protect his stability. I remind you that you have done this yourself for years and should understand it very well. This should be met with great charity rather than great fury. So great charity is that is you should understand what's going on. And if you understand what's going on, you're not going to be upset with them. And the more you understand what's going on, the more charitable the relationship and the less the need for a furious reaction will be. Because a furious reaction is much the same as living at one end of the spectrum rather than, you know, being sort of in the middle and, um, you know, not being so one-sided about things. The fury comes from your awareness that you do not love Jonathan as you should. And you narrow your lack of love by centering your hate on trivial behavior in an attempt to protect him from it. So 
she's trying to protect him from her lack of love by focusing on his trivial behavior and giving it meaning. So it's a sense, this is how much I love you. I pay attention to absolutely everything you do. So I must love you because I'm paying attention to everything you do. When in fact, Jesus is saying, the reason why you pay attention to everything you do is because you don't, you know, you not, you don't love him the way you should. And that was always a problem in the nature of Helen, Helen's relationship with her husband. She sort of married him, but she didn't marry him because she loved him so much. It was, you know, it was beneficial to her relationship and she felt she had to get married and he was available. He was a good person and, you know, he was a good catch. So she married him, but she never loved him totally the way she wanted to, the way she thought she should love the person she marries. And she was in love with Bill. And she sort of was in love with Bill. And then it became Ken, Ken too. But Ken was more like a son. Right. You also call him Jonathan. That's yeah, right, right, that's right. You also call him Jonathan for the same reason. See previous, right? His real name wasn't Jonathan. It was Lewis. I think it was <laughs> Lewis Jonathan or something, but it wasn't, his real name was Lewis. So note that a name is a human symbol that stands for a person. Superstitions about names are very common for just that reason. This is also why people sometimes respond with anger when their names are spelled or pronounced incorrectly. So he's saying people who are hung up on themselves, when their name is spelt the wrong way, they get really pissed off because they take it as a personal affront. You don't know my name, you must not know me at all. That type of thing. <laughs> Actually, the Jewish superstition about changing the names was a distortion of a revelation about how to alter or avert death. So now he's going way, way back into um, the Jewish tradition from way, way back. And he's saying, this is the way people tried to um, alter or avert death by calling people by a different name. Hmm. What the revelation's proper content was that those who change their mind, not their name, about destruction or hate do not need to die. So, so he's, he's saying something, so somebody had a revelation and they misunderstood the revelation and they altered the revelation, they altered the understanding that the revelation was supposed to bring in order for them to understand it. And the alteration of the understanding was what produced the Jewish superstition. Death is a human affirmation of a belief in hate. That is why the Bible says there is no death. And that is why I demonstrated that death does not exist. Remember that I came to fulfill the law by reinterpreting it. The law itself, if properly understood, offers only protection to man. Those who have not changed their minds have entered the hellfire concept into it. And when, you know, when I read this, when I first got this and, read and understood it, I got, I really all of a sudden understood the law in a totally different way. The law wasn't written in order to find out what we did wrong. The laws are written to help us guide us in our, our relationships with each other so that we live, you know, based on, like it says in the, the, the Constitution, life, liberty, we have inalienable rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And here's how we can all live in order to live according to the fact that we have those inalienable rights. They weren't written to find out what was going wrong. They were written to help us understand how to live in accord with our reality. And because of the because of the way they're used in space and time, 
So you get arrested because you broke a law. And therefore, then you get punished. That's the way the human mind uses them. As usual, when you understand what Jesus is saying, everything here happens upside down and backwards. We always misunderstand everything because we're coming from an entirely different perspective. When we come from a true perspective, we under law, we understand the law was written for all of us to be able to pursue life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness and do it in a way that doesn't get us in each other's way, but recognizes that we're all doing the same thing. And that's the nature of the, of the United States. That's the nature of the Constitution that we live by. But it so often gets used as, you know, the, the, the incidents of people breaking the law are brought more to our attention than the instances of people living by the law. So we become fearful of breaking the law rather than understanding what the law is actually for. Mm -hmm. Remember, I said before that because nature abhors a vacuum, it does not follow that the vacuum is filled with hellfire. The emptiness engendered by fear should be replaced by love because love and its absence are in the same dimension. Your true connect correction cannot be undertaken except within a dimension. Otherwise, there has been level confusion. And what he's trying to say is that love and the absence of love operate within the same sort of continuum of our mind, whereas hate goes below that and is operating in a different sort of dimension. So, we can't correct hate without dealing with lack of love. So a true connection cannot be undertaken except within a dimension. So when we operate saying, okay, there's either love or a lack of love, we can learn how to solve the lack of love. But when we say there's love or hate or two separate emotions, the hate doesn't seem to be associated with the love. And therefore, there's no real correction for it because it's in a dimension of its own where there's hatred, fear, rage, and that and those associated behaviors with, with, um, with hate. In the dimension where love is, there's either love or the absence of love. And because love is within that dimension, we could learn how to utilize love within that dimension rather than having it and basically what he's saying is if we learn how to utilize love we would never go down into the dimension of hate so hate wouldn't exist as a possibility in our mind because our minds would be whole in either love or the need to love because we're seeing it as a lack of love not as hatred something separate from love Returning to Mrs. Albert, not Andrews, she corrected your error about her name without embarrassment and without hostility because she has not made your own, not made your own mistake about names. So this is a person who Helen called by the wrong name. Now, when somebody calls Helen by the wrong name, she gets all flustered, upset, and aggravated. When this woman gets called by the wrong name, because she knows who she is, she's not concerned about it. She just figures the other person just doesn't know. It's not that they don't know me. She's not afraid because she knows she is protected. She made the correction only because you were inaccurate. And the whole question of embarrassment did not occur to her. She was also quite unembarrassed when she told you that everything has to be done to preserve life because you never can tell when God may come and say, get up, Dave, and then he will. She did not ask what you believed first and afterwards merely added, and it's true too. The right answer to the SCT item is when they told me, when they told me what to do, I referred to the real question of authority. So this is what he's saying. 
when he said, when they, when they told me what to do, instead of going ahead and doing what he's doing, he referred it to the real authority or like the higher authority or the Holy Spirit in order to find out what to do for the best in the situation rather than just responding to them as if they knew. Because he knew by what they were asking him that they didn't know. So it wasn't going to matter what he answered, they were still not going to know. And he wanted a way to help both himself in the situation as well as them in the situation. And that's why he refers it to a higher authority. You took a lot of notes on those who are ashamed of me before men. You took a lot of notes on those who are ashamed of me before men, them I will be shamed of before God. This was rather carefully clarified, even though the quotation is not quite right, but it doesn't matter. The important thing is that elsewhere in the Bible, it also says, those who represent or plead for me, two men, will be represented or pleaded for by me before God. And this is sort of like, you know, the rule of behavior. Uh, you know, this is the golden rule of behavior. Do unto others what you would like them to do to you. Note, this quotation is also not correct biblical phrasing, but it is what it means. Note that one who represents also witnesses for. The quotation thus means that you represent or witness for the authority in whom you believe. And basically he's saying is, what you're gonna do when you're dealing with a situation is either represent the ego <clears throat> or turn to the Holy Spirit and allow him to be the authority, the wholeness of the spirit that we all are. Allow him to be the authority because he knows as an overview of what should be done. And the ego is a limited view based on an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. So that seems to be a good place to stop um, rather than going on to the other, other section. Good for next week. And then, yeah, for next week. Yeah, I'll just read this. Your witnessing demonstrates your beliefs and thus strengthens it. So what you, you witness is better, demonstrates what you believe. And in the demonstration of your belief, you strengthen what you believe in. So in that sense, he's saying, if you witness for, I assure you that I will witness for anyone who lets me and to whatever extent he permits, himself permits. Those who witness for me are expressing through their miracles that they have abandoned deprivation in favor of the abundance they have belong, they have learned belongs to them. And that's what we're talking about. Depending on how you're, what you're relating to in your mind, <clears throat> and that's why Jesus keeps it simple, it's either the Holy Spirit or the ego. Depend on who you're relating to, you'll see what's going on. So when you see what's going on, you could look back in your mind, see what you were relating to in that instant, and then decide, wait a second, is that really what I want to come of this situation? And then we could begin to make the right decision. And the more and more we decide, the more and more we reinforce it by doing it that way, the more automatic it becomes. And the quicker the time it takes for us to refer to real authority and get a true answer rather than getting stuck in the ego and the stimulus response, 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 response that it lives in. So that's basically it. Does anybody want to say anything or talk about anything? I really like this section. I mean, it, it helped me make sense of some of the things that I'm observing in my own life, you know. <clears throat> my husband's working on kitchen cabinets and I see him getting upset and angry and blah, blah, blah. And <laughs> this isn't perfect and this isn't that. And I'm going, yeah, I knew something else was going on that what was he was demonstrating wasn't really what was going on. But I, I didn't ha have that 
key yet. And today I felt like I got the key. Oh, well, there's some, you know, it's that underlying fear, not being in love, not being good enough, not being this. And and I'm just so thankful. I sit back and I just I just kind of observe and I and I can enjoy it even though he's, it feels like, I mean, in the past, it would have felt like he's throwing darts at me because he's angry, but it's not me he's angry at. He's, no. You know, it's its own, it's its own show. It's its own show. <laughs> well, you, you know, you, if you look at that, you know, it, it, in his mind, sort of, there's the idea, well, if I can get these cabinets to come out perfectly, that would mean I'm perfect. Mm -hmm. And exactly. that's what level confusion is. <laughs> That's what no, it's just fear, right? Exactly, and that's what produces fear the way Jesus is talking about it. When we are confused about the level of what we're relating, we get afraid because there is no ability to reconcile the two, they're not in the same order. That's what he's basically saying. Yeah, it's real. It's fascinating. I, I found it fascinating. Thank you. Well, I do too. That's why I like to read these notes. I, I mean, the course was sort of cut out, cut out the personal references. So when Jesus gets into the theory about why these things are true, they show up in the, you know, in the formal course. But the reason why they get there is because he's dealing with Helen and Bill right where they are and showing them why they're there. And, the, and why, at the same time, that's not who they are. And in that confusion, which is both in our mind, strange things happen. And so if we can learn not to confuse the levels, we could be perfect whole and, and perfect and whole and innocent as we're created and still have cabinets that don't come out okay. Because what, what we do is we see out from that perfection rather than looking for the perfection outside of myself. Yeah, I tell him, I wouldn't notice. And I think most people wouldn't notice, you know, and he says, but I notice. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> you know, and it was like, oh, maybe that's why I don't remember names because, I mean, I thought it was because when I was a kid, we moved frequently. So I would just basically get to know people and then we'd move and I'd learn all these new names and then we'd move and, you know, it would, and I thought that's what it was about. But maybe it is that lack of being willing to connect. And well, maybe that's I mean, what uh, I'm enjoying now because I feel connected to people, you know. Well, that would make sense because if you're moving around a lot, you're never really able to connect, you know, as well as you could as you they were your neighbor for all your life. So in not being able to connect, that's what we do. We don't use the right names because then we have the ability to say, I don't even know that person. Why would I connect with them? Or I'm not going to know them for very long anyway. They're going to be I'm out not, of my Exactly. Life <laughs> so let me forget them before I have to go. I'll forget them now rather than later. <laughs> I know. It's funny. When, we, when you see it, like when you see it the way he's talking about it, it's yeah. not... It, 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 it changes it from a mental illness to just a perceptual problem and a lack of understanding who we are. And that's what he wants to get because there's no real, you know, that's all it is. When we don't understand who we are, things get strange. When we know who we are, huh, it's a different story. Does anyone else have anything else they want to share? Yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's good. Okay. Well, we'll see you all tomorrow then. Bye bye. I Thank, hope you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.